but we'll see. All right, now we're on. Uh, hi, guys. Welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, today we have Scott Rosen, who's going to go over um, uh, a few different topics. Uh, but right now I'm going to hand it right over to Scott, and he can start off. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me to do this. And uh, what I wanted to go over tonight uh, was a few things using um, pretty much entirely Photoshop. I want to first talk about the equalize command, and then I'm going to go over screen mask inverts, and then using the high pass filter. And um, all of these are things that I are kind of tools I use to try to bring out the very, very faint and subtle things in, in the images. And what I've chosen for, for tonight is a image that I, one of the ones I'm happier with. It's, it's some data I collected using a 200 millimeter lens on my uh, 450D, my modified 450D. And uh, I forget, I think it was 17 hours or something like that of, of uh, at F3.5 that I captured this, this data of, of the M M81, M82 region. And the, the nice thing about this image is it has a lot of uh, IFN, a lot of integrated flux nebula. And so it, it, it makes for a good image to try, to try to learn how to bring out the hidden things in your image. So what, I'm, um, what I've got here right now is, is basically the stacked image I have applied a DDP stretch. And actually, before I do that, let me show you ultimately what's in this image. So I'm going to jump to the end right now. Let me uh, pull up a, a finished product, OK? So when I, when I got done processing this, this is what was in that data. And, and not very much of it. If I go back to this other screen here, you'll see that there's hardly any of that IFN. You can see, you, you, you might, I, I know the screen screens don't look that great on, on the video, but you might be able to see a little bit of the volcano nebula in here, and that ultimately becomes this, the volcano nebula here is what it's called. And of course, there's just nebulosity all throughout the entire image. So the question becomes, how do you, how do you bring that out, or what are some of the tools you, you, you use for that? So this right here is simply the image with stacked, and um, obviously I put in a, a couple of uh, points here. Um, and, but, but beyond that, stacked, and it's had a DDP stretch. So there has been some stretching applied to this to this point. So the first thing I like to do with my images is to take a look to get an idea of what's in there. And, and for that, the, equal, the equalize command works extremely well. So what I'm going to do right now, just to kind of show you how this works, I'm going to duplicate the background image here. Okay, and I've turned off the other couple layers I, I applied later. And I'm going to do an equalize command. Very simple. It's image, adjustments, and equalize. And what equalize is great for is it, it just basically exaggerates everything in the image. If you look at the histogram, you can see it just takes your, your color channels and just stretches them across the entire thing. But what it does is it shows you all sorts of things that you didn't know were there, weren't particularly obvious. And one of them, the first thing you see is that you've got an obvious gradient that's kind of reddish over here and yellowish over here, that when I turn it off, you might be able to see it, but it's not jumping out and biting you. Okay? If I turn back on the equalize command, the other thing is you start seeing hints of all of those interesting structures. And again, there's your volcano nebula there, and you can see a bunch of your nebulosity. But what's even more interesting than that, I'm going to turn this off. And I'm not going to bother doing it right now, but I ran gradient exterminator, the, the, the two-step process where you run a medium low on it, and then a uh, you you uh, use the um, magic wand to select everything, uh, all the background area, and then run a fine medium. And I check the balance, the, uh, uh, the uh, balance background color. So this this is what is there. And I, I imagine on your screens you probably can't see any difference between it. But now if I do the equalize command again, so I'm going to duplicate this final layer here and do again an image adjustments equalize. Okay, so now I've gotten rid of that gradient. So the first thing you see, you see, and let me if I can compare it to the prior equalize. You can see the gradient is completely gone. And the background is fairly neutral. And what's more is that now I can see all of those hidden structures pretty well. Okay, those things that, again, if I go back to the original image, you see that there's, you can't 
you probably see next to none of that background with the possible exception of this volcano nebula. When I turn on the equalize command after, after getting rid of my gradient, I can see all of the hidden beautiful structures that are in there that are the big goal for me to pull out. And the other thing I'll point out is another use of the equalize command is that if you take a look, you can also see right along here up in the upper right corner where I need to crop it a little bit tighter. So when I'm all done with an image, I like to run my equalize command again and make sure that I've cropped out all of my, my edges there. So that's the equalize command and um, I said very valuable. It, it, what, it's, what you can use it for is to find out what's in there and make that your goal to try to, to bring it out. Okay? So I'll, I'll stop there for a moment and see if there's anybody any questions that you want to ask about that? Any any discussion on that? There haven't been any questions in chat, and if uh, everybody's muted, but uh, no questions, it appears out here, unless uh, anybody mutes themselves. But it looks like not. That's okay. It. Okay, then I'll go on to the next thing. So now now I know what I've got in there, and uh, this I'm going to jump forward a few steps in processing. Whoops, got to go to the other folder. And this is the image that I uh, posted for everybody they want to download. And, and uh, I, maybe I'll take a moment just in case anybody who wants to download it while we're here. I'm going to go to. You want it? Uh, God, I actually posted a link in chat already. So oh, you, you've got it. Okay, good. Okay, won't bother there then. Okay, so what this is here is after I did that initial gradient exterminate. Um, what I did is a little bit of stretching using uh, curves, and then I also converted this to a grayscale and then back to an RGB. So what I'm working on right here is the luminance I'm going to eventually use to combine. So the key is, is that all of my work trying to bring out those faint structures is going to be done on my luminance. And if you look now, you can see, hopefully you can see, I'm not sure you'll be able to see on the video, but you can see again, some of those structures, you see some of the volcano nebula here again, but you also see a little bit of nebulosity throughout this area as well. Okay, But I want to bring that out some more, and, and I could do that with some more curves, but, and then I'll just do a real quickie just to kind of show you. So if I do a curves here, and I pick, say, a, a dark background point, which is where this 2 is, is about there, and then I pick about the brightest point I can find, which is that volcano nebula, and if I'm over here uh, clicking on the output, and I'm just hitting my up arrow to try to increase the contrast between that point, I'll go ahead and really exaggerate and bring down that dark point. So now you can see I've, I've kind of brought that out some. So if I turn it off, and I know it takes a moment for screens to update, so I'm going to do this slowly, and then back on, you can see I brought out some more of that, but the problem I have, and I'll zoom in here to make it even more obvious, is in the course of doing that, if you look at the stars, you'll see that the stars start to bloat and become more obvious. And that's not a good thing. In fact, what you find is that the more you get rid of the stars, the more you minimize the star, the more obvious your nebula becomes. Well, so simple curves, trying to stretch it is not an optimal way to bring it out. It, it'll do it, but you you got to fight the, the growing stars in the process. So Jerry Rodriguez came up with this really, really slick thing called a screen mask invert. And I'm going to show you a few different ways to do it. The first one being the way that, that Jerry does it. And it's actually very effective. Has I, I, It's not the way that I ultimately do it, only because it has a few side effects I don't like. But what the screen mask invert does is it uses the screen mode to brighten up the image and specifically to try to brighten up those faint areas of the image. So let me let me show you how Jerry does it, and how he how he created it. The first thing you do is you, you duplicate the image. So I'm going to do an image duplicate. And so now I've got the exact same image in a separate window. Okay. And then um, let's see, he does a filter, noise, dust and scratches, 
and what he's trying to do is to get pick a pick a radius that gets rid of the small stars. So let me let me cancel this and kind of zoom in a little bit here. So if I, again, if I do a filter noise dust and scratches, okay, you see that all the small small stars go away. It still leaves you with some of the bigger stars, but it 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 kind of blurs them out. And now if I go back and look at the full screen. If I click between the original and the dust and noise version, you can see that you kind of get this representation of all of that background. Remember, you can see that nebulosity pretty well. So that's kind of the value of the, the dust and scratches filters, amongst other things. It starts bringing out that nebulosity. Okay. So the next thing is he does is I'm sorry, goes back to the original image. And bear with me because I don't do it the way Jerry does it very often, so I have to think about this, okay? And he applies that image to this image. I'm going to do one little thing differently just so I, well, you know what, never mind, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm, uh, we do an uh, image, um, apply image, and what we're going to do is, is the source image we're going to pick is that other image the one that we've done the dust and noise scratches to. We're going to change the blending mode to screen, and I'll explain this in a moment. And then we're going to do a mask and an, I'm sorry, the channel we're going to choose is going to be gray, and an invert, okay? So what this does is it takes that, that, that uh, smoothed out dust and, uh, dust and uh, noise filtered image and it applies it in the screen mode. What the screen mode is, is kind of imagine me having this picture on the wall and then taking a projector and projecting that other image on top of it. So it kind of does a, a, uh, an overlay of it, so to speak. Okay? And then it creates a mask from the image and it inverts it. Okay? And, and so what it's doing is it's taking the the bright parts of the image and giving it a dark mass so it's hiding the bright parts and taking the faint parts and leaving them white so allowing the faint parts through. So we take a look here I'm going to zoom in a little bit. What you see if I go back to the original version it's obviously brighter but you also see you kind of see all this, this nebulosity come through. Now, the other thing you have to do with your screen mask invert is, because it brightens it quite a bit, is you need to bring your black point back down. So if I go back to the original image and then look at that number two, this, uh, this, this point here, you can see it was originally on 38. So I want to do is do a levels adjustment to bring the screen applied image which is now at 66, back down to 38. So I'm going to do an image adjustment levels, and I'm going to bring that down. So I now have a 30, oopsie, wrong way, a 38. So that this point is the same darkness that it was originally. And so now we can compare the original here to the screen mask inverted version here and you can see that that faint nebulosity really starts jumping out and the stars are unchanged okay and if I zoom in again you'll see again if you look at the stars this time you'll see basically no change in the stars but the nebulosity has come out quite a bit and so that's the value of the screen mask invert now, the problem with Jerry's method, which, uh, which uh, by the way, let me, let me mention that doing it this way with Jerry's method is probably good enough for almost all images. Um, the, the artifacts you get out of it are not a huge problem in this image, and the reason being that this image has nebulosity throughout the entire thing. Where you, where you can also use this is where you have nebulosity in just part of the image, and the problem you run into is that, remember, we did a dust and noise blurring of the, of the image, and what that also does is it blurs 
the stars, the bright stars as well. And if I zoom in real closely, you can see probably here. If I go back, if you take a look around the star, you'll see it picking up kind of a halo, a little bit of brightening around the stars. And again, it's not too bad in this image because it's just surrounded by nebulosity. But on a lot of images, it becomes really distracting. You get a lot of halos around your stars. And so that's, that's one of the, the battles you have to fight with it. Um, I should mention, too, one of the other advantages to the screen mass converter, if you kind of look at this noisy-ish area over here, if you go back to the original one, you can see that it's, it's noisy here. It looks less noisy here because what the screen mass convert is doing is kind of uh, brightening some of those darker pixels. And so it, it has kind of a smoothing effect on the noise. So that's another one of the big advantages of using it is you can take that you know, noisy image and, and reduce the image without too much ill effect. Okay. Now, the other ill effect from the screen mask convert is that your background image, your background uh, um, nebulosity, I should say, you've blurred it, and so it's, it, you're not retaining all of the fine details in that background nebulosity. Generally, that's not an issue because in your shadows, it tends to be pretty hard to see details anyways, but it is an effect, and later on with the high-pass filter, we're going to try to counteract some of that. So that is Jerry's way of doing a screen mask invert, and I think I'll stop again and ask Adam, do we have any questions that people want to want to pose at this point? We don't have any questions in chat. Uh, if anyone out there does have a question when he stops, you guys are welcome to unmute yourself. Oh, it looks, I don't know if Sean has a question. Yeah, I have a question really quick. So the black point on the image seems to be pretty far to the left right at the moment. So yeah, over, mm -hmm. is, is it important to keep a gap in there between uh, your histogram wall and the left side so that... Oh, you're, oh, you're referring to here, to the right, histogram? Right, like, okay. like, How important is that gap in there at, like, at the moment? Okay, so uh, that, that's a great question, Sean. I will tell you that, that I keep a very big gap while I'm processing my image, okay? Because what I don't want to do is to inadvertently do something that lowers my back black point and causes some clipping. I can, at any time, I can go ahead and apply another levels adjustment and bring that black point down and increase my contrast as much as I want. I can easily do that, okay? But the, the, the problem is, is that once I clip it, I've, I've, I've ruined it, okay? So what I do while I'm processing is I keep my black point high, a big separation, okay? And my white, my white point low, again, big separation here, because in that, in that way I'm retaining all the data. I don't have to worry at all about losing anything, and I can always increase that contrast, and I wait until I'm done, until I'm all done processing my image before I go ahead and do my final black and white point adjustments to, to uh, expand the, the whole histogram. But while processing, no, you don't have to have this much, but I recommend it because if you don't watch it, and, you know, you're, you're processing along, you aren't paying attention to your histogram, and all of a sudden, boom, you've clipped your data, and now you've got to go back 10 steps to, to, to start going again. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Don, uh, we, we just got a question in chat. Uh, Josh is wondering, do you always use grayscale RGB for luminance, or do you extract it differently sometimes? Um, do, do I, I'm sorry, do I always use grayscale RGB? Okay. In, what I do, when I, when I extract my luminance, there, there, you know, there's a couple ways to extract luminance. One of them is you know, converting to grayscale. Uh, um, actually, let me, let me pull up a... Um, to answer that question, pull up, pull up an RGB version. Um, okay, so this this is not terribly colorful, but this is an R RGB version of it. Um, there, there's a few ways to extract luminance, and some of them res have different results. Um, one of them is lab color. So if I'm going to flatten this image right now, if I do an image mode lab color, okay, and if I go to my channels, the lightness is a the lab luminance channel, okay. Um, 
it, it's slightly different than the RGB, and I can't tell you exactly what the difference is, but it gives you a slightly different different version of your luminance. Okay, um, the way I usually go going back to the RGB is I do a image mode grayscale. Oops, so it told to flatten it. Okay, and tell it to discard the color information. So now I have a grayscale version of it that it is grayscale. If you take a look up here, you'll see it's telling you that it's gray. Um, what I do is I convert it back to RGB and, and that's old habit. You know, the, the reason I did that, if you, if you do your curves right now, you find that your curves are backwards. Now it turns out I have since then learned that's I'm sorry, the backwards meaning that this is your your black point, okay? And this is your white end up here. Okay, so it it, it it runs backwards to what we're we're used to seeing. Um, I later on learned that you can go ahead and reverse the scale. Um, was it this this one here? I'm trying to remember now. I'm sorry, I can't think of how it is right now. But you you can reverse the scale so it 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 works more normally. So you have your your black down at the bottom and uh, down at the left, and your white over at the right. Okay. Um, but I got in the habit of just going back to image mode, RGB, and uh, and so I'm using a RGB version of the grayscale. Okay, uh, the slight disadvantage of that is that by converting it back to RGB, I now have three channels, so the file sizes are three times as large. Okay, um, but I do work on a grayscale version of some kind. I'm sorry, there is one way, one other way to to uh, um, to, to, to uh, pull out your luminance, and that is to simply completely desaturate it. So that's an image um, uh, adjustments hue saturation, and then just take out your saturation entirely, and uh, that should give you a grayscale version. That's that's not my preferred method. Okay, uh, that answer the question, Josh. He's nodding yes. Nodding yes, very good. Okay. Okay. Uh, any others? Okay. So that is the. Oops. Let me. Uh, I've got too many copies here. There we go. Okay. So this th this is how uh, Jerry does a screen mask convert, and I would say for you know a lot of images that's that's a great way to do it now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the basically the exact same thing only this is going to be the doing it using layers and I like to do everything um, using layers um, you know, primarily because it makes it the, the problem with trying to do it this way is that if I if I get to this uh, apply image point here let's say and I decided that hey you know what that's too intense I need to adjust the opacity okay well the way that you would, because I've closed the window now, but the way you would do it is image adjustments, uh, I'm sorry, image, apply image, okay, I don't have an image to do, but you would, on, on the apply screen, you would go ahead and change the opacity, but the only way to do that, I have to go back and completely redo the whole screen mask application. So by doing layers, it gives me the flexibility that I can go ahead and tweak those layers as I'm doing it. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to copy the background, I'm going to rename this layer SMI, okay, and I'm going to do the same thing we did on the other one. So instead of duplicating the image, I've duplicated the layer, and then I'm going to do a filter noise, dust and scratches, and I know that 15 pixels was worked well for this image. I should mention, by the way, let me go back a second here, if I zoom in a little bit, um, filter noise and uh, dust and scratches. Okay, the radius of your pixels will determine how large the the stars are that you eliminate. So if I if I change this to 50, well, you can see that I still have some star remnants in these various places. If I change this to say 50, you'll see now that those stars are you know pretty well washed into the rest of the background. But the problem is that I've lost more detail in my IFN. Uh, so it, it's kind of uh, uh, exaggerated the problem of losing detail. So you you don't want your pixel to be, your your radius to be too large. You don't want it to be too small. If I make it say five pixels, you can see I still have lots of 
little stars still in there, so that's not effective enough. So in this case, 15 pixels, oopsie, missed, yeah. 15 pixels seems to work fairly well, good compromise, okay? So we've applied the, the dust and scratch filter. The next thing we did on the other version I had, the, the Jerry method, was we did a screen mode. So I'm going to change the, the mode of this layer to screen. And again, you see it brightening. And then it was a mask and invert. So on the mask, what we're going to do is we're going to take the background. I say, first of all, let me create a mask. We're going to do a layer, layer mask. I'm going to start with a reveal all. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with mass, you know, a, a mask will take whatever is white in the image and allow that to show through. Whatever is black or dark, it will tend it will block that. So if it's if it's pure black, it allows none of that to come through. If it's you know some shade of gray, depending on how dark it is, the darker it is, the less of that portion it allows through. So what I'm going to do is take the background image and I'm going to select all and edit copy. So that background image, in other words, this version here is on the clipboard right now. Turn back on my screen layer. And then if I want to see what's on the mask, if I do an Alt and then click on the mask, I am looking at that mask right now, which we start off with a reveal all, so it's all white. And now I can paste that image. So I do an edit paste. And this will look exactly like the background layer that we have below it because that's all I've done is paste it on that background layer. And now I'm going to invert that. So I'm going to do an image adjustment invert. And it's going to make everything that's black make it white and white make it black. So now what you see is what this mask is doing is that where you have background, like here, it's white, meaning it's going to allow through this screen layer on the background and where it's black or dark like in the center of this galaxy it's going to block that as well as those stars okay so it's going to hide those 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 things there so now again I'm looking at the mask right now if I click on the icon for this layer image I'm now looking at the screen layer that has been masked and inverted and you would call when, when I did initially the applied the image and did a screen and then checked mask and invert. I basically had this and the problem was that if I look at my point, it's back at 66 and it started off at 38 so I need to do a levels adjustment. So I'm going to go ahead and do a levels layer here. So this is a levels adjustment layer. And one of my odd habits is on, on a layer where I'm not using a mask, I always delete the mask. So I'm going to right click and delete that layer mask. In this case, it was a reveal all mask. So it has no effect by removing it because I'm still revealing the whole thing anyways. But the only reason I do that is that sometimes it's hard to see whether there is a mask on that layer that's actually doing something. Like if you look at this, this, uh, this mask right here, this inverted mask, it's pretty white, so it's not terribly obvious to me that that mask actually has something on it. Of course, if I alt-click on it, I can see that it does. But by deleting the reveal all mask on this levels layer, it's now clear to me that there's no mask on this layer. Okay, So I don't have to be wondering what is, what is the mask on that layer doing. So you don't have to do it, it's just one of my my habits, okay? So again, we wanted to get this this uh, number two point back down to 38, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, adjust that. And then when I get it close, in case for those who don't know, if I click in the black point here where it says 29 right now, and if I do an up or down arrow, it will increase that by, or, or decrease it by one, so I can move it very accurately. And now I have it back down to 38, okay? So what I've done now is the same thing I did with the way Jerry did with the apply image, in that I've got a layer that's in screen mode right there. I created a mask from this prior image, inverted it, and ended up with a bright image, and then brought the levels down. I used a levels adjustment to bring the black point back down. And now with levels, I'm sorry, with the layers here, if I want to display it without these other layers, if I hold down the Alt key, 
and click on this background here. It'll turn off all of the other layers. So this is where I started. And if I do it again, it'll turn it back on. And this is where I ended up. Okay, and, and what I've done here look, will look exactly the same as what Jerry did before. The only difference is I've done it on layers. Okay, and so why, why did I want to do it on layers? Well, the thing is that now, if I want, I can go ahead and do some more tweaking to these layers. Matter of fact, I'm going to throw in one more concept here, and that's going to be groups. So I'm going to click on this little folder here to create a group, and it show, creates this folder here. I'm going to rename, right-click and rename that group to SMI group, my screen mask invert group. And what I want to do is to put these two layers into this group. If I do them, if I hold, uh, click on this one, hold down the shift key and click on the second one, I've selected both of those layers. And then if I drag them up to that group and then let go, you'll see that they're indented a little bit, showing that these two layers are in this group. So what that does is I can now turn off the entire group together. This is kind of the equivalent of when I alt clicked on the eyeball here. So I can turn off and I can turn on. Okay, that's not a huge advantage, although you will find sometimes if you have a whole bunch of layers, you just want to see what the effect of three or four of those, those uh, adjustments you've done is. You can put them all in a group and just turn them on and off to see what, what those three adjustments do instead of having to look at the entire thing. But the other thing I can do here is I can say, hey, you know what, this, this uh, screen mask convert is too intense, okay? It, it's, it's, it's getting carried away. So I can adjust the opacity of this group Let's just say take it down to say 45%. And I've now reduced the opacity of both the SMI layer and the levels layer at the same time. And so it, it's retained the same 38 black point, never changed that. But my screen mask invert is a little less intense than what I had before. So, so you can see the opacity effect. If I go back to here, there's without the opacity change, there's with the opacity change. And sometimes, as a matter of fact, a lot of times with screen mask inverts, you'll find that they're too intense. As a matter of fact, most of the time when I apply a screen mask invert, I try to apply it typically between like 25 and 50%, depending upon the image. Now, this particular image handles it really well because, again, like I said, it's got nebulosity all throughout, and the whole point is to bring out that faint nebulosity. But a lot of times, you want to go ahead and adjust your opacity to make it either more or much less. So let me stop there and Adam, any any takers on questions? I'll, I'll ask a question. This is Sean. Okay, Sean. Um, so so uh, uh, the problem that I run into trying to use the screen mask invert is it tends to just blur the image too much if I use the dust and scratches. It tends to, I, 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 like on this image, it appears to do a really good job. But on the images that I've tried to use it on, it really just tends to, it, it's, it acts like a huge uh, noise reduction filter. So I have to try to use maybe 15 or less than 20 percent. Uh, okay. Well, you, you, you are absolutely correct, okay, and that, and, and um, so two things with that, and, and, I, and I will say that the, the um, you learned it from the first video I did, the, the uh, DSLR, LLRGB uh, image I did, and there are two, two, there's two big mistakes I made on that. One of, uh, one of them is that it's, that like this image, that was, that one was a, a M45, and it was data that, that, uh, um, Neil Heacock had gathered, and, and M45, in and, and that particular image in, in general, had, had beautiful nebulosity throughout, and so it handled uh, applying a heavy screen mask invert like this one really well. And, um, and so I left that one at 100% and never, never once mentioned about opacity, okay? And that was a big mistake because after that I, I did see a lot of people uh, doing that. And you have the, the effect where it does bring out all that faint nebulosity. But, but the downside is you also end up with that blurring effect, a really, really fuzzy effect. So the, the answer is a couple things. Number one, and, and, and I'm going to show, I'm going to do one more 
even more complex way of doing this because I, if there's a simple way to do it, I, it's not good enough for me. I have to find the hard way. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do another screen mask convert and show you a few refinements I've done, uh, some of which are, are very much geared towards reducing that. But the, the two big things you want to pay attention to is to try to keep your um, d uh, dust and scratches filters, your radius fairly small. That, that makes a big difference. The larger the, the uh, uh, dust and scratches, in fact, if I go to this one right here, right now, I go to this and I, and I do another, this is an ideal way to do it, but let's say I go ahead and do another uh, noise, dust and scratch, and then I'll really exaggerate it and do 100 on this one here just to really totally exaggerate it, okay? So that's going to take a moment. Um, you'll, you'll see, you can kind of see it right now, that, actually, let me wait for it to finish here just so, you, so I can show it to you better. So I guess the larger the, the radius, the longer it takes. Yeah, that's what my images look like if I choose a small radius, though. It seems bizarre. Okay. I, feel, I feel like I'm missing something. Yeah, so there's two things. Again, first of all, just to compare the two, if I go back to this one, you see that, that the nebulosity is fairly sharp. I, I see like a, a little dust rift right in here, so to speak. And if I go to the large one, it gets kind of wiped out. And you kind of get this buffeted look throughout the whole thing. Okay, so that part of it, that's the big radius. The other thing is it's, it's applying the whole group at 100%. So one of the things I could counteract that would be to reduce the opacity. That's not not quite that much. And so what I would say for most images, you want to apply your screen mask invert at typically between 25 and 50 percent um, and, not, and not with a huge radius like I have right here. Okay, so whereas if I take, um, actually let me zoom in on it here. This might give you an idea. So when I have it at the 100 percent radius, yeah, maybe it's not as obvious. And there, let me go back out. Now, at 100%, you can really see kind of that smooth look. If I reduce the opacity of it, it doesn't show that smoothing as much. So I said that there, there's two, there's three big things, Sean. The, the part of it's going to be the next thing I do, which is showing a little refinement to it. But it's uh, keep your pixel radius small where you can, and don't apply it at 100%. If you, if you, if if doing it at 25% or 30%, some lower percentage, doesn't give you enough brightening of your dim area, then the answer is to do another screen mask invert at another 25% and not to do a 100% application of the screen mask invert. Is that, uh, have you been doing 100% typically? Uh, no. Uh, generally, less than... 20 between 25 and 50 percent, and I, I, I just it just seems to blur the image too much. Maybe it's my data specifically that just, that just happens. Yeah. Uh, now some images will take better to it than others, um, but the and the other thing too is give you an idea um, is let, let's say I was doing this on a picture of a galaxy. Um, Jer Jerry uses an example uh, uses M33, and so what you picture with M33. Is let me, let me let me real quick uh, pull up an M33 here. That's the wrong one. Um, let's pull up my M33 to give you an, an idea. I believe it's this one here. Okay. Okay. Not not an incredible M33, but but just to give you an idea, um, what hide that. What you see here is that with M33 you have all of this really faint halo, which the SMI works really well to bring that stuff out. But in the course of doing that, it also ends up brightening all this stuff in here, not, not quite as much because that is the more masked portion of it. And so you kind of end up with this blurred effect inside the galaxy. Well, the answer to that is that after you do an SMI, almost invariably, you need to go ahead and increase the contrast and that's where doing the high pass filter comes in, and that's that's going to be the final thing I show you tonight. So um, I said, but th those are all you you are correct. Those are all downsides to doing a screen mask invert. Is you have to be careful, or you can end up with these not so wonderful artifacts. Okay. Um, so 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 part of it. Hold your question. Okay. <laughs> um,
Any others? Okay. Okay, now let me show you the really complex way to do this. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the problems I mentioned with the screen mask converts was the problem of star halos. And I've more or less developed a technique that I think works fairly well to eliminate those or to minimize those. And basically, you'll remember that we, we blur the stars by doing the dust and noise sc uh, scratches. But in the course of doing that, we also end up um, taking some of the brighter stars and blurring around them, which kind of creates a halo around them when we add the screen that projects that brightening on them. Okay? So one of the things I found can work pretty well is by reducing the star sizes. So what I'm going to do, in this case, I'm going to use um, Carboni's Actions. I, I, by the way, I've created a second layer, and I'm going to rename this as SMI. This one's going to be with our stars shrunk. And it's basically use whatever your favorite routine is for shrinking stars. Well, we're going to really shrink them a lot. Um, now, Carboni uh, isn't very aggressive in its shrinking, so I'll, I'll have to run this a few times. Um, but just to give you, I want to give you an idea of what happens, and I'm going to, I, I prepared a, a version of this image that already had the stars shrunk. Okay? Um, so that's the first. So I'm going to run this, say, about three times or so. And, and you'll notice a few things out of this when I do this. So bear with me while this runs. I should mention that my favorite routine for shrinking stars now is using Images Plus. Um, it has a really slick uh, uh, version of, of shrinking stars. That, um, it's really easy to control. works really quickly. <laughs> That's so instantaneous, and that's when the, the next version I show you is going to, going to have that. So this will give you the idea. So if I if I go back, if I turn off this layer right now, you can see that it has shrunk the stars. They're less obvious. And if I again zoom in some here and compare, turn off that shrunk star version, you can see that the stars are definitely smaller, less obvious. Okay. Only I end up doing it even more. Okay. Um, and I'm going to pull up that version here in a minute. The other thing I want you to notice is that by just by virtue of shrinking the stars, how much more the nebulosity shows. So if I turn this off, that's with the original stars. And if I turn it back on, you can see that the, the, the shrunk stars really help the nebulosity to pop out. And that's, that's not critical for the screen mask invert, but it's something to keep in mind when you're trying to bring out faint nebulosity in an image, it's hide your stars, make your stars shrink, and you will immediately see more nebulosity. Okay? So that's the effect of shrinking stars. I'm going to pull up a prior version I, I pre-created for this purpose where I really shrunk the stars as much as I wanted, and that's uh, prepared SMI layer, okay? Um, select all, edit, copy. So I'm copying this previously made version to the clipboard. And I go back to the image we were working on. If I, if I paste what's on the clipboard, it's going to paste it as a new raster layer. So this is my really shrunk star version. I'm going to rename that to SMI. In fact, this is, this is too shrunk for the purposes of using it in the image. The prior one I did with that carbonic running it three times, that actually might have worked pretty well for this that image. It looked pretty normal. But you can see in this one the stars are just abnormally small. And, and if I zoom in on it, in fact, they're so small that, um, let's see, maybe it's, you'll see that I've got some dark rings around the stars. So I've shrunk it way too much. You would, you would never want to do this normally. But remember with, with the dust and scratches filters, I'm going to go ahead and blur this. So this, this bright part here is going to get blurred, you know, 15 pixels. Okay, remember, let me go ahead and do that right now so you can kind of see this. Filter, noise, dust and scratches. I'm going to apply the same 15, oops, that's 100 I have on there right now. Okay, let's do 15. And so you can see now that the fact that it had a little bit of a black halo around it doesn't matter at all. If I zoom back out, okay, I've completely eliminated 
those stars. Okay, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned one other thing. Um, let me go. Let me go back. This is the Carboni shrunk version. I'm sorry, I I, I got ahead of myself. Um, so after I shrink the stars, the next thing I do is I meticulously go through, starting in the upper left corner here. And keep in mind, I'm going to be using a, a version that has the stars shrunk even more. And what I do is I'm going to clone out some of the brighter stars so that they aren't there at all. So with that, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not clone. I'm going to use the, the spot healing brush tool to clone out those stars. So it creates a circle. I can adjust the size of this circle by on my keyboard. If I do the right bracket key, it makes it larger. If I do the left bracket key, it makes it smaller. And it's a great tool for cleaning up little things on image. In this case, what I want to do is go through and eliminate the brighter stars, the ones that might be too big to you know, increase the size of this, too big to wipe out with the dust and scratch the filter. And again, I don't have to worry about making it look terribly perfect because I'm going to blur the whole thing with the dust and scratches. Okay, So I would go through here and you take all the stars that are relatively bright and clone them out. And yes, it does take a while to do that. And that's why I'm not going to do the whole image right now. But it, I, I think it's worthwhile. Okay, so that's so it's two things. I'm going to on the SMI layer. I'm going to shrink the stars quite a bit, and then with the remaining brighter stars, I'm going to use the spot healing brush to clone them out. And had you done that, I'm going to delete this layer again. Then you would have ended up with the version that I previously pasted onto there. And it copy this and then paste this on and we'll call this now our SMI layer. So now what you see is I've got, and I, I have not, I've not dust and noise scratched, uh, blurred this yet, but you can see I've got very little stars in there. And so if I zoom in, a couple things. First of all, I don't even have to use this bigger radius now. So Sean, that's part of the answer to your question is that I, I, I don't have to, when I do my dust and scratches, I don't have to do 15 pixels, maybe I can get away with, let's see what 10 looks like. And you see on 10, I don't really see much stars at all. There's the stars before. There's with the dust and noise scratches. So I can get away with a smaller radius, meaning it's not going to smooth things quite as badly. And so now I've got, so, so now I have the equivalent of what we did before with just doing the dust and noise scratches, but I've done a less aggressive dust and noise scratches, and I've gotten rid of all of those things that are going to create artifacts, uh, artificial halos around the stars. Okay, So then I'm going to go ahead and, like we did before, change this to screen mode. So now it brightens the image. I'm going to create a mask like I did before, so I'm going to do a layer, layer mask, reveal all. Then I'm going to copy the background image, select all, edit copy. I'm going to alt click on my mask. I'm going to edit paste. And I'm going to do one more small thing here. I'm going to do just a little bit of Gaussian blurring of this here, just, just so I don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between my mask and the original image. So I'm going to do a filter blur, Gaussian blur, and you'll find with many masks you're better off giving them a slight blur. And I think maybe just two pixels will probably probably work well enough. Can't see it at this scale. Let me zoom it in here. And if I go back a step, you can see the stars just get slightly fuzzier. It's not quite an exact one-to-one -one correspondence with the, each pixels on there. And then I have to, it's a screen mask invert, so I have to invert my mask image adjustment invert. Okay. And so now I have my screen layer and I have my mask. Now one other thing I can do if I want to make it so that this screen mask invert pushes more into the faint parts and less into the bright parts. If I increase the contrast on my mask, then it's going to make the dark parts of the image whiter on the mask, allow them through more, and do the converse with the 
with the bright parts. So if I, I'm going to alt click on the mask, we'll look at the mask again. And the way I can do this is do an image adjustment levels. There are a few ways to do it. I like to use levels for this. And you'll notice that I've got a little bit of, a little bit, it's an inverted mask. You kind of see it looks like a, like the backwards of what you normally see where you've got your data way over here on the left. All your data now is here on the white. All your background is in the white area. So if I take this and move the white point foot over, you can see my mask brightens. Go back here, a little darker, bring it up here, and all the background stuff brightens. And I don't really have to worry about clipping. I'm kind of clipping the mask, but it's just a mask. And I can move my black point over, and you'll see that the bright parts get darker. So now what this would tend to do is it would push, it would make more of the screen layer show through in these background areas, the faint areas, and it's going to block it more where I have stars and, and galaxy, okay? So that's what I would normally do, but I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do that while I'm looking at the mask. I'm going to go back to the image. So if I click on the image icon here, I'm now looking at the image with the screen mask invert applied. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the mask. So you see it's got, it might be a little hard to see in the video, but it's got a little highlight around it. Here the image has a highlight around it. Here the mask has the highlight around it. So what I'm doing now is going to be affecting the mask. So if I do that same levels adjustment, the one I just canceled out of, to image adjustment levels, I can see what it's doing to my image while I am adjusting the mask. So if I move my white point, okay, you can see that, if I turn off the preview, you can see it kind of brightens the whole thing a little more, but most of that brightening is concentrated in the background area. And if I move my black point over, it's going to reduce the effect. If you watch the galaxy here, yeah, maybe it's not terribly, I'll, I'll exaggerate it here. You can see that the galaxy is less brightened if I really push it over here as opposed to that. So I'm just doing a little bit of a, con a contrast increase on the mask. The point being to concentrate more of the screen layer on these faint areas and less so on the bright areas. Okay. And then, of course, I need to do my levels adjustment. So I'm going to do levels. I'm going to look at my info palette. And I'm going to bring that black point so we bring it back down to 38, if I recall. That number two point right here. And then I'm going to create a group so I can put them both in my group. OK, and now I can turn off the screen mask convert turn it back on and you see it and now if I look you might recall I showed you earlier a little bit of kind of a brightening around the stars if I zoom in real tight if you kind of look at this star here when I turn it off you don't see that brightening halo around that star like you used to again this image not critical for because it wasn't a big side effect of it but in many other images you'll see some really serious halos come out and this is how I eliminate those that's by shrinking the stars quite a bit and cloning out or, or spot healing the brighter stars so that is my very complex method for making a screen mask invert and again on most images you're going to want to reduce the opacity of your screen mask invert and better off to do two of these at a lower opacity than one at a higher opacity, okay? So I have less of an effect, but it, you, you end up with less of that blurring effect. Um, I said in this case, I'm going to leave it 100%. I wouldn't do this with the actual processor. I'm going to leave it 100% because I want you to see more of the effect of the next step, which will be the high-pass filter. So that is my overly complex way of doing screen mask inverts. And let me once again ask anybody have any questions they want to throw out. Scott, I have a question for you. Is that Josh? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, sometimes when I'm working on images that have like a lot more detail in the nebulosity, um, like Pickering's Triangle, for example, uh -huh. and I try to use those dust and scratches filters. Um, no matter what radius I pick, there's a lot of kind of like real fine lines in that dust that start 
getting damaged uh, whenever I run that filter. Um, uh -huh. so, I, so I can't select enough of the stars to remove them before I um, damage the dust. So sometimes I play around with the threshold level. I'm curious if you have a strategy for that. Um, for the, the threshold on the, uh, on the dust and scratches? Correct. Um, to be honest, Josh, no, and uh, that's probably a, a very good idea. I, I um, um, let me see if I can go back. I can find here's dust and scratches. Okay, um, it, you know it's something I haven't played with, and it's actually I, I completely forgot that that's even there. Uh, filter noise, dust and scratches to show you what Josh is talking about. Here's my radius. The threshold, I believe, it, it affects the brightness. I think of what it. Um, is that right? Yeah. I think the higher the threshold, the brighter the cutoff of, so in other words, if you take a look now, here, here's it with, in fact, 255, it's applying nothing to it. So let's, let's say I take it to 128, split it in the middle, okay? And you can see that the brightest stars, it ended up, um, it, it ended up, up affecting those. If I take it down more, it goes to the Less brighter stars, so um, you know it's probably a really good thing to play with, uh, Josh, because I could go ahead and make it so that it's affecting stars and less so nebulosity, and therefore retaining some of those fine details. So, do I have a strategy? No, but uh, you, you've got a very good point that that's probably a very effective tool for controlling for for not blurring your your um, uh, uh, your, your nebulosity too much. So I'm going to turn the question around to you. Do you have a strategy for that? Um, well, it's actually what you were kind of going at. It's not just blurring the nebulosity. It's to the point where like it actually puts holes in the nebulosity. Um, and I guess you know they've talked a lot of talk about the I can't remember his name JP's tone mapping to deal with some of that, but it just gets really tedious and not very consistent removing the stars that way. Um, but seeing what you're doing might be a new way to try it. I've never actually tried reducing the stars with multiple iterations and then running the uh, dust and scratches filter. So that, that might help addressing that somewhat. Yeah, I, I will tell you, it, it definitely helps a lot. Like part of it, A, you don't have to use as big a, a, a radius for starters, okay, and, th and therefore, which you are blurring, you're not blurring as heavily. Um, I mean, it's it's almost to, to some to some extent, it, it's almost not doing the same thing. The screen mask inverted. I mean, the screen mask invert used the inverted mask so that you weren't affecting your your stars. Was a lot of the goal of the the inverted mask. Um, by by eliminating the stars, it becomes less significant to do that. So in, in in many respects, what I'm really doing is is trying to create a map of just the nebulosity and applying just the nebulosity as a, a, as a screen layer effectively using the screen mode to bring out the nebulosity so it, so I said it, it, it it's it's kind of a perversion of Jerry's screen mask invert which like I said if you notice my first steps versus my later steps Jerry's steps are really easy <laughs> okay or comparatively easy this isn't but uh, the result I think is better Right. Um, so I'd say, you know, give it a try. So I, I really, I really found by shrinking the stars, you know, dr dramatically, it really, uh, it really helped control a lot of those side effects. But uh, I like the idea of that threshold. I'll have to play with that some more with some of my future images. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, other questions? Is yeah. Anybody... Come on again. I'll ask another question. Okay. Uh, is it important to do the uh, the the repair tool, the uh, the brush, the healing brush tool before you do the dust and scratches, or can you do that and then use the healing brush on the residual stars, the stars that are left over? Or is it important that you do it before? Um, I would say probably important to do it before. And uh, let me go. I don't think I. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so here's. Here's before I started the healing brush. Okay, the um, the problem is is that if I if I do a dust and scratches here, filter noise, dust and scratches, and let's let's just leave that that radius of ten. Okay, um, uh, keep in mind that this this was not as heavily 
reduced as the one I ended up applying later because I lost everything I just did. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the problem is that now what you're going to do is is you've you've still got those star artifacts, and now I'm going to go ahead and try to spot heal that out. And when you do the spot healing, if if you look at it's, it's not always quite perfect. It might be a little hard to see, but sometimes you kind of end up with a little bit of a darker ring in there. Okay, so the thing is, by by cloning it first and then blurring it, you kind of taking that dark ring and spreading it throughout, so you don't end up with the 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 clone the the spot healing side effect. Okay? okay, so I think it's I think you really want to do it first. The other thing is is that you you after you do the dust and scratches. You're going to end up with less stars. Okay. In other words, if I, if I if I do it here, if I try to get rid of lots of the stars, you can see there's all sorts of little stars there. Well, the minute I do the dust and scratches, um, it it uh, you know it, it it gets rid of the, the the numbers of stars you have to deal with. So yeah, uh, do the do the cloning first, attack okay, just just the brighter stars, and then uh, uh, the, the not cloning the spot healing. I'm sorry, I do the spot healing first, and then uh, attack the stars. So now I'm sorry. I have to go ahead and recreate what I, what I did because um, because I wiped it all out. <laughs> okay, so give me a second. I'll give you give you a chance to look at it once more again. I'm going to take my prepared SMI layer, the one that already has been heavily star reduced and uh, spot healed. Edit, paste, change that to SMI. I'm going to change that to screen mode. I'm going to create a reveal all mask. I'm going to select all on my background, edit copy. See, once you know how to do this, you can do it very quickly. Edit paste. I'm going to do a slight Gaussian blur, blur, Gaussian blur, and invert that mask, image adjustment, invert. I'm going to go back and look at this image. I'm going to select the mask and increase the contrast a little bit by doing a levels adjustment. Bring my white point down, clip a hair, and bring my black point up. And then I need to do a levels adjustment. Get rid of my reveal all mask. Go back here. I want to set this to 38. This one here to 38, and like that. And then I'm going to create a group, rename it SMI group, and I'm going to select both those layers and let's try it again, and move them into the group. And there you have an SMI in what a minute. <laughs> okay, one more chance for questions. Okay, so next thing is um, again, and not not too obvious on this. And by the way, one more time, I'm going to repeat. I'm leaving this one at 100 percent. I would say most images you don't want to do that. Most of the images play with your opacity and adjust it down to make sure you're getting a minimum of artifacts. You know, particularly some of the really heavy buffeting look and and uh, um, you know any other artifacts you get out of it, but in, in general, keep in mind that part of this process is you're applying a blurred image to your image. And so you're going to lose some detail and lose some contrast. And so invariably what I find is that you want to follow up a screen mask invert with a high pass filter. And what a high pass filter does is it basically increases the contrast on a specific range of detail level. Um, it, it, it has the effect of sharpening. And I would say you don't only want to use high pass filters after a screen mask invert. I, I would say you almost always want to use a, screen, a high pass filter after a screen mask invert. But it also, it, a high pass filter is really good in general for A, trying to bring out some details and B, trying to bring out contrast. If you're looking at an image in general that seems to lack contrast, yes, you can apply a contrast curve, but a lot of times a high pass filter is a better answer. Okay, So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close up my SMI group and I'm going to create a new raster layer. 
Now, normally, you know, we, we create uh, raster layers by you know, duplicating layer, taking my background layer and copying it, and I would have a copy of this here, but I can't do that with this group up here. And Oopsie, I'm sorry, I wanted to delete that, and I duplicated it a second time. I can't do that with this SMI group here, and also if you have groups that you've applied or, or layers that you've applied at uh, less than 100% opacity, you can't simply duplicate things. So, so how do you go ahead and create a new raster layer from what you have here to go to the next level? Of course, one way is to flatten the image. If I uh, layer flatten image, okay, well now I've got a clean raster layer to work with, but I don't want to lose all that those layers. I, I like to keep my layers there for you know quite a few, quite a, quite a ways until the image just gets too large. So I'm going to undo my flattening. So the way you do that is what's called a CAB layer, a uh, combine all below layer, CAB. And so what you're going to do is a select all, which is selects everything you've got there. And then if you do, instead of an edit copy, you do a copy merge. That is going to copy everything on all of these images, okay, and then if I do an edit paste, it creates my new raster layer, which you'll see if I turn it on and off, is identical to what I had up to that point. So that is a cab layer, combine all below layer. And the other way to do a combine all below layer, if I delete this, and you're not going to be able to see me do this, so remember this one, it's basically press every key on the keyboard. It's You do a control, alt, Shift, so there's three fingers right there, that's all with my left hand, and then an E, E is an Edward, so Control, Alt, Shift, E, and that is a single keystroke to create a cab layer, combine all below layer. Okay, so if you can't remember the, the keyboard stroke, it's just select all, one more time, select all, edit, copy merged, not just copy, copy merged, and then edit paste, okay? And I will, one more thing just to show you, because you'll do it sometime. If you leave your group open, like I had there before, you can still do it. Select all, edit, copy merged, edit, paste. The problem is, is it, it puts the layer in the group. So what you have to do is drag the layer up above the group. So that's why I close the group first, so I don't have to bother dragging it afterwards. So now we have a brand new layer, the equivalent of having flattened and started this image over, but I still have my old groups in case I decide later on, oh, you know what, that, that SMI was too strong, I should have reduced the opacity. While well, I still have it all there, I could just go ahead and delete this layer, go back, reduce the opacity on the SMI group, and create a new cab layer and start from there. Okay? So this one we're going to rename HPF for high pass filter. And uh, to do high pass filter, you change your screen, I'm sorry, your, your, your layer mode to either um, overlay mode or what I almost always find works better for me, um, soft light. And when you look at the soft light mode, I mean, you can see it obviously makes it much darker, much more contrasty, so that's, that's not the answer there. What you're going to do on the soft light layer now is we're going to do a filter, um, other, high pass, okay? And with the high pass kind of shows you this, this grayscale um, uh, preview. Not, not really a preview. It's kind of a, a mapping of what it's going to affect, okay? And depending upon what level of detail I want to uh, adjust, I'm going to use different radius and look at different parts of it. So what I'm what I'm interested in right now, and I'm hoping you can see this well on your screen, is what I want to do is to try to bring out the contrast in the IFN. Actually let me let me do it a different way. Let me first show you, let's say I wanted to use this to restore some of the contrast in M81 here. Okay. If I adjust the radius, if I go down to say five, okay, you can kind of see again this is how the image looked, but it shows you how the what portions are being affected and how they're being affected. So it's basically, you can see it's it's increasing contrast on these very fine details, as opposed to if I go to say 20. Okay, those contrast isn't as fine a detail. Matter of fact, it's it's probably bigger than 
the galaxy itself. Okay. In fact, let me zoom in on M81 while I do this so you can kind of see what the effect of the high pass filter would be. So filter other high pass. Okay, so at 150, you kind of notice if I turn on and off the preview and, and look at the main galaxy here, at 150 pixels, it has no effect on the galaxy other than to brighten the image in general. But you can see I'm not seeing virtually any change in the detail. Well, that's because the radius of my high pass filter is, is you know, probably bigger than this, what we're seeing on the screen here. It's huge, okay? Whereas if I go to, let's, let's go to to the other end, one pixel. Okay, I can't even see it there. Let's go to five pixels, and you kind of, if you look at our little preview thing here, you see it has this little effect on this level of detail. If I turn on and off the preview, looking at this galaxy, you see it, it tends to bring out a certain level of detail. If I go to 15, it brings out a different level. So you see how you kind of see the spiral arms stand out more. Actually, let me let me let me go ahead and apply that. If I, the problem is that you're comparing it to the screen mode. So if I turn off the high pass filter now and watch the spiral arms and the details in M81, you can see that it definitely brings up the contrast and kind of defines those spiral arms better. So if I were trying to bring out the spiral arms, that would work pretty well. Now, by the same token, if you kind of look at the background here, in fact, let me zoom in a little bit tighter as I turn it on and off at that scale, it also kind of makes it look noisier too. So if I were doing this, I'd want to go ahead and mask it only to M81. So, oops, see, hold on. <laughs> mask it only to M81 so that I was only affecting this part that I wanted. Whoops, sorry. I'm losing control of my mouse, um, and, and not create this noisier look in the background. Okay, but um, but that's not what I want to do with this high pass filter. I'm not that concerned for the moment about M81. So let me take it back to where we just had changed it to soft light mode. What I'm really more interested in is I want to see if I can let me turn off this layer. If I can bring up some of the contrast in my IFN. And so I'm going to look at it at this much larger scale. And so again, I'll do a filter other high pass. And I'm going to zoom out this window so I can see those large scale structures. And you will notice that at 15 pixels, I am not seeing anything emphasized on my on that, the, the level of the IFN. It's much larger than that. So if I go to, say, 40, Okay, I see a, a little bit of, but still way too small. It's mostly on this size of this galaxy level. If I go to, say, 80, now you start seeing, and it may be hard on the video, but you can start seeing, if you look at the volcano nebula, you see some contrast between the volcano nebula and the surrounding area. You know, let's say I go up to, say, 150. Now you can probably see that there's, it's showing you quite a bit of contrast between that IFN, and in fact, if I go ahead and let's apply this one, and if I turn it on and off, you can see that it does kind of add some definition to the IFN. But there's one other big problem, and that is if you take a look at the stars, let me zoom in on it, it'll be really obvious here. Look at your stars with that high pass filter, and you can see the stars brighten a whole lot. Of course, you might remember when I showed you the the shrinking of the stars, how shrinking the stars made the IFN stand out more. Well, obviously, shrinking them makes them worse, bright, uh, makes them better. Brightening them makes the IFN less obvious. Start losing it in those stars. So the way I'm going to fix that, because I, I do pick up contrast in my IFN, but the stars are becoming a problem. So the way I'm going to fix that is I'm going to mask out the stars. Now last week, um, part of your lesson had to do with masking stars, and there's there's a few methods to, uh, you can use. Um, the one that I commonly use is I'm going to go back to this, click on this background version here so that I'm using this as a sample. And this is, again, um, you know, God bless Jerry Rodriguez. He, 
he's taught all of us so much. I use a, a this is another Jerry Rodriguez method I use, and that is his method for selecting stars. It's basically using the magic wand, and you can adjust your tolerance. Jerry usually starts off on the tolerance of five. Um, I'm going to go. I'm sorry, tolerance of 20. Jerry starts off with. I'm going to do a tolerance of five, and we select a background area, and you'll see that it starts selecting everything that's fairly close to that. And I'm going to hold down the shift key and just keep selecting different backgrounds until I've selected virtually everything. And if I was doing this very carefully, I would end up, we want to choose, we want to choose everything that's background and not star. So these galaxies, I'm going to go ahead and keep holding down the shift key again, select those, and basically just keep doing this until I'll end up with is basically, I'm going to zoom in really tight so you can kind of see, basically have virtually all the stars selected. The fainter ones, the really faint ones we're not seeing too well, but certainly the brighter ones are selected. Okay, So that's, that's one very good method for selecting stars. Um, again, I kind of prepared this. I'm going to control D to delete that selection. I'm sorry, let me show you one more thing. Let me control Z. I have those selected. Let's say I like this selection. I was all done very carefully going through the image and making sure I had the gazillion stars in this image selected. The next thing I would do is I would save this selection because once I've got once I've got the trouble of selecting it, I might I might want to use this later. In fact, I know I'll use it later because later on I'm gonna to want to you know, saturate my stars or do some tweaking of them so I can just go ahead and pull up the same selection and, and use that. So I would, to do that, if you do a select, save selection, you can give this selection a name, and for the moment I'm just going to call it stars, and now I, if I want to reuse, I'm going to control D, deselect that, that selection, and go ahead and say, oh, I want to use my star selection, I can load that save selection. I have several save selections in here, by the way. I've prepared them before. And I'm going to choose stars and it's that same selection without me having to go through that whole process again. But I'm actually going to use a slightly different selection, and that's one that I did go through carefully to select the stars. And I already saved that as a, a selection called All Stars Unfeathered, meaning I've done nothing other than select those stars. And if I zoom in on this, you can see I've got lots and lots of stars selected. Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure I did this met this with the same Jerry method. I the other method I, I use for selecting stars involves Images Plus, and it involves using uh, Images Plus new feature, the feature mask, to separate the stars and nebula, and um, and it creates a, a, a great star version and a great nebula only version and you can use the star version amongst other things for selecting stars, you may using it as a star selection. So anyways I have these stars selected and what I'm going to end up doing is using these stars I want to hide them, make a mask to hide them, but if I zoom way in you'll see that the selection is pretty good but I can tell that this, in fact if I turn off my I pass filter here, just kind of watch the brightening, you'll see that it brightens a little bit outside of my selection right now. So what I want to do just to make sure that I get all of that star is I'm going to expand my star selection. I'm going to do select, modify, expand, and I'm going to expand it by say two pixels. You see it gets larger. And then usually you want to feather your your uh, selection you know, typically around half of the the amount you expand it, but that's you know it kind of depends. I go ahead and feather this one by two as well, so the feathering makes it so it kind of rolls off that selection. So you can see I still have looks like pretty much all the stars selected, and so now if I zoom out, you can see I've got this huge selection. Matter of fact, if I go back to the original selection before I expand and feather it, you can see that the selection is more obvious. I'm thinking you can see it. I don't know on the video. Maybe you can't. Okay. Um, and now I'll go back to my high pass filter. I'm going to turn back on that layer. If you've got a selection, you can then create a layer mask from that selection by doing a layer, layer mask, and you can either reveal that selection, which in this case would only reveal the stars, in this case, we do not want the high-pass filter to affect the stars, so we are going to 
hide this selection. We're going to hide the stars on this layer. And so now I've got that selected. If I disable, I can right click on the mask and disable it, and you'll see the effect of the mask. So there's the stars are pretty bright, and you see the mask has an X over it now. If I right click and enable the mask, you see the stars get dimmer. If I zoom way in, again, you can see if I disable the mask, the stars brighten up, enable it, they go back down. They're not there, the stars I'm seeing are from the underlying image before that. And if I zoom out and we look at the overall effect of the high pass filter now, if I turn it off. Okay, again, kind of keep an eye on this volcano nebula is where you'll see it the most. Is you'll see the nebula is more defined, that volcano nebula. And if I turn it off again, if you look at the stars, you'll see virtually no change in the stars. You get a little bit of brightening, not very much the stars, but the overall, the nebulosity stands out even more. And the other thing I'll say about high pass, I'm sorry, let me not do that yet. Let's do one more thing, and that is look at M81 and M82 here. When I turn on and off my high pass filter, okay, you'll see a couple of not so good things happening to M81 and M82. First of all, M81 and M82 are brightening quite a bit, but keep in mind that the radius of our high pass filter is not on a scale that's good for M81 and M82. It was good for those big large scale structures. So all it's doing is brightening M81 and M82, and the other thing is, is because I've got some mass stars in there, if I, you can probably see it where you are, but it, if you take a look at the star right here, as I turn off the filter, you can see there, there is a little bit of a ring around that star already, but when I turn it on, man, it just really exaggerates those rings around the star. If I alt-click on the mask, remember if I alt-click on it, it shows me the mask. You can see that's because I've got this large radius mask, which wasn't a problem in the background areas where there was it was you know fairly close to dark anyways, but here on M81, where it's very bright, well, that suddenly makes it really obvious ring around there. So I've, I've got to say, well, what am I going to do about M81 and M82 so they don't end up with these ugly artifacts? Well, the answer there is say, well, I don't want to apply the high-pass filter to M81 and M82, but I've already made my selection. I guess I could have gone ahead and selected M81 and M82 while I had my star selection. Um, and, and then, then that, I would, they would have been added to the hide all mask. But again, using uh, groups, I can do some tricky stuff. And that is I can make kind of this multi-layered mask. And what I'll do is I'm going to create a group. And I'll right click and rename this high pass filter group. I'm going to drag my high pass filter into that group. So now it's in that group. And now what I'm going to do is what I want to do is select M81 and M82. By the way, while I'm at it, we've got some other background galaxies here. Let's take a look at those guys. Um, there were a couple of... Yeah, here's our... Oopsie. Here's our nicest one here. And uh, let's see, is he having the same effects? Well, he's brightening too. Not necessarily. The uh, I don't see quite as bad an issue with the halos, but you know I've kind of got you know, perhaps a similar issue with that galaxy. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to select M81, M82. One way I could do that, I could go ahead and take my lasso tool, create a feather of the right size, let's just say 20 pixels. And I could go ahead and run around M81, M82, and hold down my shift key now. The shift key changes my, my lasso tool to an add. Let's see, and I can go ahead and lasso M82. And I could go ahead and last to each of these galaxies as well. I'm going to be really sloppy about this right now because that's what I'm going to end up doing to select all these galaxies. But I'm going to do a Control D. I've previously prepared a selection already doing just that very method. So I'm going to go to my, my selections and I'm going to load my M81, MA2 feathered 25. So I've already selected M81, MA2. And if I do that, you'll take a look. And here they are selected from my previously made selection. And in fact, if I want to go ahead and add another selection to this, I go back to, I've 
got another previously saved selection, so I'll select load selection, and I'm going to add to this selection, and then choose the other one I made, which was all background galaxies feathered. So I already pre-selected using the lasso tool, using a different feathering, a smaller feathering of I think five or ten, the other galaxies in the image. And so you see all around the this image, I've got all these little galaxies selected. And so I say, okay, now that I have all these selected, what I want to do is I want to hide those. So on this group layer, I'm going to select that level, and I'm going to do a layer, layer mask, hide selection, and I'm going to alt-click on that layer mask so we can see it. So now what you see is, is I've gone ahead and throughout this image, I've told it, you know, painted black basically on these galaxies on this mask so it says do not apply this layer to these parts of the image so I've got this very complex thing that says hide all the stars and then after you hide all the stars hide the galaxies too and so now when I turn it on and off you'll see that the galaxies don't change okay so there's the high pass filter off and here is the high pass filter on. If I zoom in on M81, M82, you can see when I turn it off. There's really no change to those two galaxies at all. If I disable, if I right click and disable the layer mask, you'll see all those ill effects come back to M81, M82. There's it disabled with all those ugly halos. Enable it, and it's no longer affected. So that's how you can use groups to create more complex uh, selections. So you don't have to sit there and, you know, if you were trying to, if you had all the stars selected, then try to go through and find all the galaxies to select them. It'd be a real nightmare because you got all these flashing, marching ants, and then trying to find a galaxy in there. That's no fun. So, uh, th th you know, th so think of group layers as be also another way to do some fancy complex masking. And then one final comment on high pass filters. Just like SMIs, more often than not, you don't want to apply them at 100%. In, in, in matter of fact, with almost everything I do, I almost rarely apply them at 100% because it, it's, it's, it generally leaves an image with a more natural look if you leave some of the underlying initial image intact and then apply whatever effect you are at kind of a more modest level. So I will almost always reduce the opacity of my high pass filter layers to something, you know, it depends upon what it is, but just something to make it a little less obvious. Um, and then the other thing too is keep in mind that I, I don't you don't have to do just one high pass filter with a radius of 150 like we did. Is I might want to go through here and do another high pass filter and do a well maybe do a radius of uh, you know 15 or so like we saw work you know fairly well on the galaxies to increase some of their contrast. Or maybe I want to go ahead and come back and do one at at uh, 75 and maybe get a little bit finer details in some of these the the IFN. So a lot of times it might make sense to do you know hey maybe a a 40% opacity on this layer and then go ahead and come back and do a, 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 a radius of say 75 and do another 40% opacity on that one. So we just kind of blend in varying levels of opacity to bring out different levels of details in the image. So uh, uh, any questions there about high pass filters and masking and such? Scott, this is Josh again. I have another question for you. Uh -huh. um, I think always the most challenging time to apply those masks um, are on images that have nebulosity running throughout and really dense star fields. Um, and then you run into that kind of ring around the star artifact everywhere. Uh -huh. um, the, it always seems like the most challenging time to apply those star masks and do any kind of high pass filters. Do you do anything special? Um, when you're dealing with that that kind of image, yeah. Um, well, Josh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay, um, and uh, uh, well, first of all, in terms of high pass filters, is not too bad because the the answer on high pass filters 
is where you've got a lot of nebulosity. We kind of showed it here, but this image has a lot of nebulosity. Let me change this back to 100% here. Is that that the answer is on your star selections is to make sure that you expand it well beyond the stars. In other words, there's not a particular downside to having a selection that encompasses the star plus some of the background in the case of a high pass filter, okay? Because what you're going to tend to do is to just affect less of the nebulosity, okay? So that so my answer for high pass filters is typically to make sure I expand it to well include the stars. And like I said, you can see with this one here is that you're not seeing any significant ringing around those stars when, as I turn it on and off. Um, but you, you, I mean, there's, there's, there is that kind of general problem that, that when you've got stars embedded in a lot of nebulosity, trying to segregate what you're doing to stars versus what you're doing to, to uh, um, the surrounding nebulosity becomes hard. Usually the answer is where I might have selected, use that, that uh, star selection. Let me go ahead and load that star selection here again. Um, okay. Um, usually the answer is to zoom in and say to myself, what do I really want to affect on this on this particular image? And in some cases, what you want, and maybe what I want to do is to reduce just the really bright core of the star. Well, in that case, I'd go ahead, I'd take the selection, modify, and contract it by a pixel, okay? Or maybe even two pixels, do it again, okay? And then you can see at this point, I'm mostly selecting the core of this star versus it plus the halo, okay? Uh, I should mention that Jerry's method of selecting stars by doing the magic wand and selecting the background, what's good about it is that it tends to select the star plus much of the halo. Um, there, there, there's other, there's better methods if I just want to select the core. Um, last week, I, I, who, who was it that, that um, was, uh, did, did it last week? It wasn't you, Josh, was it? Yeah, it was me. It was you, okay, you were the one with all the, with all the, uh, the storms, okay? <laughs> so, like I said, the method that you used last week, if I was trying to select primarily the cores, if I recall, you were doing, um, it wasn't highlights, I think you were doing a, a, a selective color range, is that right? That's correct. Yeah, so that or highlights, those will tend to to select more of the center of the star. If I do that right now, I can do a select color range and um, uh, a sample of colors. Here we go. So if I Drop my fuzziness down to you know there, and I select. Up, oh, you know, I think the problem is I think I'm on a mask. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Uh, select color range. There's always there's always some reason it's not working correctly. Okay, and uh, go ahead and select and do a little more fuzziness. Okay, so that's kind of the idea of what Josh was doing to create a star selection, okay? So in that case, if I go ahead and apply this very quickly done, you'll see that I end up, tend to end up with, you know, mostly a lot of the center of the circle. I didn't, I didn't do it very well. But um, if, you, if you do it carefully, you can end up with mostly the core selected. The other one is you can do a select um, a color range um, highlights. will tend to select the cores of your stars, okay? So sometimes the answer just depends upon what it is you're trying to select. You know, where do you want to start with? In my case, like for this for the uh, this high pass filter, I want to be sure to include the halos because I I don't want it to brighten those halos, and that's why uh, Jerry's method of selecting the background will tend to leave those halos selected, okay, um, included in the selection. I'm sorry, I just realized I demonstrated that wrong. I selected the, all this. I did the magic wand to select all the stars, okay? What I forgot to tell you you need to do is you need to invert the selection. I've got the background selected right now, <laughs> okay? So select, uh, modify, I'm sorry, select, select uh, invert. Where am I? There we go, select inverse. That would have selected the star. So don't, don't just select the background. It's select the background. When you're done, invert the selection so you're selecting the stars and its halos, okay? <laughs> I, there, there I am spreading more bad information. Um, Anyways, the answer, so the answer to you, Josh, you know, be best method is to say, you know, what, what can I afford to have selected, what can I afford not to. In the case of high-pass filters, I, I think you're generally better off 
expanding it to include star plus more nebulosity rather than less. That that, that help you. answer? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Other other questions? I'm I'm thinking not. So uh, Adam, I don't know. Do you want to open up for anything else or? Call it a night or what? Actually, at this point, we usually just open it up for uh, any chat. If anyone has any comments on Scott's methodology or anything like that, they're welcome to share it. I'm actually impressed with uh, how you demonstrated the, the use of groups because I had no idea that you could apply a layer mask to an entire group. And ah. that's really cool. Okay, so somebody learned something tonight. I know that. <laughs> yeah. I learned several things, Scott. I think you did a great job. Oh, well, th thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I should mention, too, um, two, two things about this particular image is that if um, on my website, if you go to my links page and then scroll down to the bottom, um, I've got, um, I think many of you have seen my original DSLR LRGB uh, walkthrough video. That was the one using Neil's uh, M45. But I did do, using this very same data, I did a, another walkthrough video, and yes, it's another two-hour walkthrough video, I'm sorry to say, um, but using this, this, this very data itself, and it, it's the complete walkthrough, and much of what I did tonight is, is in there. And, and I should mention the same breath that, because obviously if you're following the Astro Imaging channel, you're interested in, in Astro Processing, is that if um, on, on this page um, I've got links somewhere, there, there we go, to the DSLR Astro Image Processing Group, the Yahoo group. Um, I, I am a moderator on this group. I, I don't get paid for it, so I don't feel badly uh, 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 highlighting it. But for those who are interested, the DSLR Astro Image Processing Group, what we do is once a month we take an image, somebody's data, and we make what we call a challenge out of it. If you go the, you have to be a member to go to this, so you'll have to subscribe. But um, in the photo section, we have um, all of these these various challenges we've done in the past. I'm sorry, I don't want to do all this first. I want to do alphabetical. Um, starting with the very first one, Neil did a few years ago with uh, M42. And what we do, we do is we post the raw stack data, and everybody in the group is welcome to download that, that data and then process it and then we post our images like for instance this one here was uh, challenge 25 right here we use that for challenge 25 that's why I did the walkthrough video for that and then you have all these people who have done their processing on them you know some some work better than others um, you know this, this is a pretty nice one I'm not so hot on this one but but we post it and then we discuss it and, and the idea is to do constructive uh, uh, criticism, you know, uh, what, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, here's a, here's a technique for improving that. Um, and, and some of the people are, are very talented processors and, and everybody on the group seems to learn. So, uh, and, and in fact, you're also, if you, if you join the group, all of this challenge data um, for all, I think we've done 27 now, I think we're up to number 27. Um, yeah, th uh, th it's Yahoo. It changes the order every time you touch it. And we've done 27 challenges so far. The most recent one being this M101 here. Um, all of the data for all of those are available. So if you want some some data to play with, um, the, the, if you join the group, you're, you're welcome to download any of that data. And and again, you can post your processings for others to comment. Even on the old challenges, you know, the ones we've done a few years ago. If you want to you know, go ahead and try doing a row of Fuki and say, hey, what do you people think? You know, then you can post it and uh, we'll give you comments and feedback on it. And, uh, and the other thing, you know, there's a you know, lot to learn there. We've done all sorts of you know, HARGB and so on. The files section I'll mention too, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of good files in there. A lot of them are the uh, workflows for what people have processed, the, you know, the, the workflow they actually used to come up with their version of it. But the other thing is we have um, some info sections. Um, uh, let me try to find the info. Here we go. Info Photoshop tips is an example. We've got a lot of uh, like white papers in here that we've that we've created. Um, um, you know, I create a series for star shrinking, different techniques for star shrinking, etc. So um, 
you know, you're all welcome to to join that. Just like I said, easy, easy way to get to it. It's, it's a Yahoo group, but you can just go to my uh, links page. Um, on my links page, I have a link straight to it, but also on the on both of those workflow, those those walkthrough videos. I did those for that group, so I invite anybody who's interested to join the group and uh, see if you can learn something there. And end of plug. <laughs> Shameless plug. I'm going to join that. I want to see those star reduction techniques uh, scattered throughout. Actually, it looks like there's a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, there, there, there are a lot of. And I should mention that there are people in the group that use Photoshop, Images Plus, PixInsight. We have lots of people that use all three of those. We have a few people who use Star Tools, a few people who use Nebulosity. Um, so I, I, for, for those latter two programs, I'm not sure you'll get a lot of uh, program-specific information, but, but you know, there is, you know, the minute I start talking about how you do something in Photoshop, well, there's an analogous to do it in any of the other programs, and so you can, the, the general concept you can apply to the other programs, and so a lot of it, even though I don't use PixInsight, you know, the, when the people start talking their foreign language of PixInsight, I, I still pick up some, you know, techniques there. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Hicks Insight does a great job, but then why, I go back and forth because watching the way you actually get the immediate feedback when doing the layers and stretching the mask with the immediate feedback, that's what Picks Insight doesn't give you. And uh, we always we go back and forth over uh, the benefits of it and Picks Insight versus Photoshop. Not that we really get into the debate, but uh, it's uh, it's always interesting. Uh, one thing does one really well, and the other thing does one amazingly. Yeah, and uh, you know, f for me, I, my my contention is I, I will get into the debate in, in the respect that I, that my theory is is that we, we've got a lot of good programs for processing um, Photoshop, Images Plus, and PI are the ones that immediately come to mind for me. And my belief is that you can come up with great images with any one of them. It really is a matter of learning how to use them. Um, it, the, the biggest reason I have not tried to learn Pix Insight is because I still feel like there's so much I need to know about using the two programs that I already know how to use fairly well. You know, Pix Insight and Images Plus. So I, you know, to me, it, it's you know, pick a program or more than one program and learn it well. <laughs> I think you can come up with incredible images with all. But I've seen, I, I have, I, I've seen, you know, Rogelio's images with PI. I mean, they kind of say to me that maybe this is must be the ultimate program because he, 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 he was a Photoshop user and obviously knows how to use Photoshop and, and he's he's uses PI all the time now. So I, I think it's a obviously a great program, but I think for for the vast majority of us, the limitation is our knowledge of what we can do with the program we are using. Yeah, I think that's almost always the case. You can always make it better with uh, if you understand the program a little bit more. Yeah. Scott, what what do you use for cal uh, stacking calibration? Which program? Um, I use Images Plus, um, and and um, uh, mostly mostly because what I started with, but I'm glad I started with it because I think it does. Uh, a, a great job, and, and Mike Mike unsold to me. I will tell you one thing about PI versus Images Plus. Again, I think both of them are incredible programs. The um, the, the one thing I'll say is that from what I, my knowledge is, Pix Insight is is a, a program that's being developed by a small group of programmers that have come up with some really slick stuff. Uh, Images Plus, uh, it astounds me that it it is. The you know when you open up Photoshop, it shows you a list of all the people who have been in development with it, and you know while it's loading, and um, there's you know, probably 200 people involved there. Well, well, if Mike did that on on Images Plus, it would say Mike unsold. And it just it just blows me away that this guy has created this entire program, and what's more is that he is constantly improving it. He's about to come out with uh, Images Plus 6.0. He's got he's actually got it in beta right now. And he's uh, he's done things like taking the stacking programs 
uh, the, uh, the aligning programs, I mean, and, and uh, improved upon it where it worked really well before. He's now got it so it's you know, kind of completely automated and stacking even better. I had problems uh, you know, with, with Images Plus trying to stack some of my, my wide field stuff until Mike kind of showed me how to, a little bit of a manual method to do it and then it started doing it perfectly. But now he's got all that stuff built into 6.0 automatically. He's, he's building into it lab color modes and, and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, to answer your question, Adam, I use I use Images Plus and I think it really does a superb job. One of the nice things it has in a, I, I think PI has something similar, but I'm not sure, is that it, uh, it, it automatically scales the dark. So if you've got a bias frame in there and you're you know, you're slightly mismatched on temperature or, or some such, then it'll, it does some scaling of it. So I, 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 I think I end up with better calibrated images because of it. I, I can't say that with certainty because I don't, haven't compared it to taking the same stack into DSS or something, but uh, I use IP and really, really like what it does. Yeah, I know a lot of DSLR users use Deep Sky Stacker. And I used it for a long time, and I liked it for a long time. And when I started using PI, I noticed better results straight out of calibration. So I actually stopped using that. And I'll imagine, uh, I'd uh, assume that Images Plus kind of steps it up as well. Yeah. The, um, the other thing I will tell you, my, my big objection, objection to DSS is easily overcome. And, and that is, but it, the problem is, is that the defaults on DSS are wrong in that the default on DSS is it applies a screen stretch and then saves it with that screen st stretch. You can change it to tell it not to apply the screen stretch, but the default is to apply it. And I, I cannot tell you how many times I've seen people post their stacked DSS data that has had a DSS screen stretch applied. And it's not a good starting point because what you've done right off the bat is you've bloated your stars before you started processing it, and um, so that that's that's my big objection to DSS. And I said it, it it's that if you use DSS, know that you should be saving your stack TIFF without applying the screen screen stretch. Otherwise, it's probably fine. <laughs> I point that out all the time. Whenever telling people about DSS, don't save that final uh, when it asks you. Don't save. Don't save changes, or, or I, I forget how it refers to it, but. Yeah. It's um, um, I can tell you because I, <laughs> everybody gets to see my, my notes here. Um, oops, wrong, wrong one. Um, it's embed, but do not apply, right? When you say yeah, that, uh, that's right. something I like have that. This I have this file that says, in DSS, save picture to file in the saves options. Make sure embed, but do not apply option is checked. <laughs> Okay, I specifically save those notes so for that very purpose, so I know exactly what to tell people to do. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments, related or unrelated? I joined the dark side. Who's that? CCD? I'm, I'm getting the QSI 683. Nice. Oh boy. Yeah, I sold my camera today. I, feel, I, saw it. I saw it on the mark. I feel very bittersweet about it. but Is that Josh? Yeah. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Definitely Thank a bittersweet you. night. <laughs> well, I, you know, I have a friend of mine that he, he bought a, an ATEC, um, uh, I forget which, it's about a $2,000 camera. It had a fairly small chip, but I think, I think your 583 has a, about an APS-C size chip. Is that right? Yeah, I, got, I actually got the 683 that's got the filter wheel and off-axis guider included, and it has that uh, KAF 8300 chip in it. Okay. So. Yeah, his his has a smaller chip, and and the, and the camera's that much smaller. But I will tell you, he's he's really coming up with uh, some really nice stuff. You know, small chip, but but really, I mean, I, you can see that there's there's a there's an advantage to the to doing a CCD. Yeah, what, well, what it came down to me for me was I'm working on building an observatory and I want to automate everything. And just with the uh, filter drawer, that wasn't happening. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> new adventure. <laughs> well, good luck with it. Thanks. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Scott, thank you very thanks much. a lot. That's good. 
Well, my my pleasure. I, I enjoyed it. Hope, hope I hope I didn't bore anybody too much. <laughs> Not good. at all. Not at all. Went very smoothly tonight too. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, my my thunderstorms. Actually, I'm looking outside. I see a moon. Maybe it's clear. Mm. Where are you, Scott? Where are you? Well, I'm I'm uh, on the on the west coast in uh, Southern California. Oh. I'm in the. Uh, if if yeah, anybody. It's it's for the last for the last however many weeks I missed the last couple of weeks because I was up in Sequoia but for the last couple of weeks everybody's been complaining about the weather and I gotta tell you we actually have rain down here I'm in Moreno Valley I don't know where you are Scott but Southern yeah. California yeah yeah so. we're uh, oh, I'm 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 uh, west of you uh, you know where Mount Pinos is yeah I'm I'm on the back side of Mount Pinos basically uh, okay. Mount, Mount Pinos is two miles of the crow flies from my house okay yeah yeah. And that and that's not an accident, by the way. <laughs> but but it's just funny that we actually had rain, good solid rain today. Yep. That never happens. Yeah, so. we did too. It started about four o'clock in the morning here and went till about ten. So, oh. b badly needed. Our force was looking pretty pretty sad. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, thanks again, everybody, for inviting me. I I, I appreciate it and enjoyed it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Bye -bye. I appreciate it. Okay, Josh, have fun on the dark side. <laughs> okay, bye bye, everybody. Have a good one. Bye right, bye. Good night. good night. Good night, guys. Looks like Cloudy Nights is back up. Up and down. Oh, meanwhile, do you guys know when I drop out of this, do you guys automatically get dropped out of it? I did last I week. I've ever stayed on. What's that? I don't think I've ever stayed on after you've dropped. Okay. Yeah, I've I think Josh, uh, you got you got dropped off last week, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. My wife was tapping her foot, waiting for me to get off the call. So. <laughs> yeah, mine too. It's probably a good thing you dropped off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a common problem, I guess. Hytham has the same thing. Do we have, um, I guess on another note, do we have anything scheduled for the next couple of weeks? Do we know what's going on? You know, we don't have anything scheduled. I didn't mind the format that kind of developed uh, just as an open chat format uh, when you when you had your thunderstorms. Mm -hmm. And if we needed to keep a placeholder for when we don't have speakers, that's always available. I know Alex has some presentations available as well. Um, so between something like that, uh, we'd probably be able to make it work out. Uh, unless you have any other ideas. Um, I, I don't know that I'd be prepared next week. Um, and then maybe the following week is uh, uh, the star party in West Virginia, which I'd like to go to. But um, uh, I think we should do a tone mapping one at some point. We've been playing around a lot with that. I think that would be a fun one to do. That would be great, yeah. I mean, I we're definitely leading, leading up to it. So uh, I think that would be a very good idea. If we could get JP to do it, that would just be uh, unbelievable. But <laughs> is, we he, could, we could, is he in Italy or is he here? I think he's in Italy. He came. I, did you go to Neat this year? I did. Yes. Did you see him? No, I didn't. I didn't go to the uh, the conferences. I just went to the, the show. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think he is in Italy, but I think he comes here to do conferences pretty regularly. So. Um. I don't know. It might be worth reaching out. I don't, but I don't know him, so I couldn't reach yeah. out to him. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw. A, a, I don't know where it was, but I saw a display he did. It's massive. It's on metal panels, and uh, I want to say it was 40 feet across. And uh, I have no idea how he got that resolution to do that. But he said it was the mosaic he did uh, suited it. So who knows what kind of work he's doing. He's well. My dad went to the conference and watched his presentation. He's doing a lot of work with um, taking RGB with a telescope on top of his longer focal length telescope and taking you know, mono data with that and just just shooting it out at the same time. It's uh, unbelievable to see what he's doing with that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, if the other person, I, I guess maybe some of you know Anna better, maybe she would be good to do that. If not, I can keep working on my technique and try a presentation. But <clears throat> yeah, um, I haven't seen her around cloudy nights, but we could always try PMing her. Yeah, she... she she posted that M42 last year whenever she came out with that crazy dusty M42. But mm -hmm. 
I haven't seen her since then. It might be worth a PM to see if she's interested. Yeah, definitely. Well, now, is she? did she move back to the States, or is she still in UK? That's a good question. I have no idea right now. Yeah, because we will have that problem with time zones, but we can always work around that somehow. Is it Anna? But, yeah. Yeah, she's back in the U.S. She is. Yeah. She, like, she's got to be mobile or something. She posted a... <laughs> on the forums about not having a, a permanent setup anymore. That sucks. Mm -hmm. That's the way I am at my dark site now. I'm setting up every day. I'm right. remember, remembering how to polar align again. <laughs> I, I like going to the dark site more in the winter time. I've just been doing nothing but mono from my house during the summer because you only get a few hours. But during the winter time, I can go out at 6 at night and get in like 10 or 12 hours of of shooting, but then but then you gotta sit in your car and freeze all night. <laughs> yeah. Always a trade off. Yep. I'll just be happy for some clear skies. I don't care if it's winter, summer, fall, whatever. <laughs> just get rid Touché. of some of these clouds. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm waiting for uh, my William Optics scope. I bought uh, the Woe Star 71, so I'm excited for that. It's not going to show up for a few weeks. I am really excited to see what you do with that because now that I, the other main reason that I went to the CCD was that I would not have been able to come to focus with that telescope, and I really wanted to get it. And I, that was, I was like, well, I want, I want to get a telescope like that at some point, but I can't come to focus right now. So it was like, I just, just got to deal with the problem and get a camera that's going to be more versatile. So uh, hopefully you're putting up. Matt. Yeah, I, I hope so. I've got to find a, uh, I think, actually, I noticed the the schematics on the website. There are two different schematics for the same scope, and the back focus, the specified back focus distance for each is different. So rather than calling Taiwan, I'm email them and find out. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm interested to see what you find out because I actually did email them and I emailed the guys at Agena Astro and they were both pretty adamant. I think it was that 66 millimeters or whatever it was. And that was from the M48 threads. 66. Okay. Yeah, yeah so that that would be okay for me. I think I still need to – I probably need a precise parts adapter for it because uh, I'm at 57 with the STF and OAG. So uh, a nine millimeter adapter, and I don't want to have so many threads that I'm always struggling with my uh, r with rotating it because they can always unthread, and you never know. So yeah. one thread's better than two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, the other one I have my eye on is that Stellar View is coming out this this month, um, which is a lot cheaper, but that looks pretty cool too. Uh, F five point six sixty millimeter apo. Hey Josh, this is Tim. Hey Tim. Hey, when you use your DSLR, did you ever uh, use a field flattener? I do. Okay. Sure. I did. Did you notice any of your stars? Your stars in your center were they? They were round, but on the outer edges, even using the flattener, did you find them to have be a little bit elongated? Um, I switched from that Hotec or Hutec two-inch SCA flattener to the Telescope Service one. Um, and it all went away. That one was really awesome. Yeah, um, better than the Hotec, huh? Yeah. And what, what refractor was that on? Uh, the SV105 triplet. S Stellar View. 105. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a friend that's got a uh, a Stellar View that's he's he's got the Hotec, and he says he still has problems around the outer 10 percent or so. The stars are not round. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> I actually did notice that. I used to have the SV102 ED. The uh, for whatever reason, when I switched to the triplet, the 105 triplet, the stars start.